Yesterday, we identified the seven types of electromagnetic radiation, starting with, over here, radio waves, microwaves, good. Oh, you're going too fast for me. What comes next? Infrared. What comes next? Visible light, which consists of, which consists of, of course, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And of course, when we look at this, we see that infrared is just below red. What comes next? Ultraviolet, which is just above violet. And then, of course, we have X-rays, and we have gamma rays. Good. Yesterday, I told you that you do have to be able to identify any type of EMR from its frequency, from its wavelength, from its energy. So there's seven different frequency ranges that you have to be able to know, essentially, seven different wavelength ranges, seven different uh, energy ranges that you have to know as well. But the good news is you only have to actually memorize three because you can figure out the other 18. If you're given a certain frequency, you need to compare it against those three known frequency ranges. Microwaves were the 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 12 hertz range. So if you have a, mic a, 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 a type of EMR that's given to you as a frequency of 10 to the 10 hertz, it's going to be microwaves. 10 to the 11, it's going to be microwaves. X-rays, yesterday I think I told you the wrong number for X-rays. I think I said 10 to the 17 to 10 to the 19 yesterday. It's 10 to the... 17 to 10 to the 20 hertz. So if you're given a frequency that's 10 to the 18, it's going to be x-rays. Visible light, we got to be more specific with that because it's such a narrow range. It's 4 times 10 to the 15, 14, sorry, to 7.5 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Now, if you get a type of EMR that has a frequency that's not in one of those three ranges, that's okay, because we can fill in the blanks. If you get 10 to the 7, it's got to be radio waves, because it's not microwaves. If you get 10 to the 13, it's got to be infrared, because it's not microwaves and it's not visible light. So if you get something that's outside of these ranges, that's okay. Deal with it. Memorize these three. There's no way around that. But figure out the other ones based on filling in the blanks. Now, if you get a wavelength given to you and you have to identify what kind of EMR it is, you've got to calculate the frequency. And that's going to come from the wave equation that you learned back in physics 20. V yes, it is. Yes. V is equal to F times lambda. Rearrange that to solve for frequency. V over lambda. V will always be, for any of these types, radio waves all the way through gamma rays, will always be 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second in a vacuum. Divide it by the wavelength that's given to you, solve for the frequency in hertz, and then compare it against these three known ranges. So we're at the point now where even if we're given a wavelength, we have the frequency because we found it ourselves, and then we can just do what we did a few minutes ago, comparing the frequencies. Shiva, question? Now, we can do something pretty similar with that with energy for that as well. Uh, but I'm not going to give you the equation for that yet. That'll come later on in the unit. There is an equation similar to V is equal to F times lambda that will allow you to find the frequency of the EMR from its energy. And then you would, given the energy, find the frequency, compare it against the three known frequency ranges and identify what kind of EMR it is. Is that all right? All right, today we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about the spectrum than we, they, than we did yesterday. Today, in addition to the frequencies and wavelengths and energies, we're going to talk about specifically what causes each type of EMR. Generally, we say it's accelerating charges, but specifically, what is it that's causing it? Well, I have radio waves and microwaves grouped together here because they're produced in more or less the same way. We say that radio waves and microwaves are both produced by oscillating electric charge. What does that mean, oscillating electric charge? If something oscillates, what is it doing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's going back and forth, back and forth. So we've got electric charge that's going back and forth, back and forth. 
the electric charge that goes to the wires in your house oscillates at 60 hertz, 60 cycles per second. And as it does that, it accelerates, it speeds up, and then it slows down, and then it stops, and then it reverses direction, speeds up, slows down, and stops. As it does that, it generates really, really low frequency, really, really low intensity radio waves. There's nothing you have to worry about, but it would generate low frequency, low intensity radio waves. You ever driving down the road, listening to the radio, listening to a hockey game, or listening to music on the radio? And you drive under a big power line that goes over the highway, and your radio cuts out for a few seconds. You ever notice that? Sorry? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it could, could be, okay, because the hill could be an issue with diffraction. The radio waves diffracting around the hill. Um, but certainly when you drive under a power line, sometimes that happens as well. Yeah, yeah, sometimes overpasses as well, and that's an issue with kind of shielding there. Um, but the issue with the power lines is that these power lines have really, really high voltage electrons going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And they generate radio waves. And they generate stronger radio waves, of course, than the wires in your house, right? Sometimes those radio waves interfere with the radio signal that you're trying to listen to on your radio, the music or the hockey game or the baseball game that you're trying to listen to on the radio. Oscillating electric charge generates both radio waves and microwaves. All right. Infrared, visible light, ultraviolet. We group these together as well because they're produced in the same general way as well. We say they're produced by transitions of electrons. From high levels to low levels. In atoms. If you've taken chemistry, you know that electrons exist on levels, and you know that they can make transitions. Sometimes they jump to a higher level, sometimes they fall to a lower level. If there happens to be a vacancy in the first level, then an electron is going to fall down to that first level to fill in that vacancy. It's kind of like if you're young and poor, and you go to a hockey game, and you pay your 30 bucks to sit up in the sport check zone, and you notice two seats down in row four that are empty for the entire first period, then what do you do? You go down and fill in the vacancy, fill in those two seats, right? Um, when you make a transition from a high level to a low level, you give off energy. Okay, these electrons, as they make the transition from a high electron level to a low electron level, give off energy in the form of either infrared, visible light, or ultraviolet, depending upon the transition. Now, x-rays can also actually be produced that way as well, but it would have to be a really big transition for that to take place. Be like... You know, buying a ticket for the very highest seat in the saddle dome, seeing a seat in the first row right by the glass and making that transition from the highest seat down to the lowest seat. That would be analogous to the x-ray being produced. Okay, the biggest, a really massive transition taking place. Usually, we say that x-rays are produced by rapidly... decelerating electrons. So what happens there? Well, usually what happens is that we accelerate electrons across a potential difference, right? Car going down a hill to a really, really high speed, 10 to the 7 meters per second. And then we smash them into a metal target, and we cause them to stop almost instantly. As they do that, they decelerate very quickly, right? Accelerating charges. They decelerate very quickly. They generate EMR. Look, they had a lot of kinetic energy because they were going so fast. That energy has to go somewhere, so it gets released in the form of an X-ray, a high energy, a pretty high energy bit of electromagnetic radiation. Gamma rays are produced by nuclear decay. And what do we really mean by that? You've heard of that before, perhaps, but what does it really mean? Nuclear decay can occur in radioactive decay and a reaction called the fission reaction. Nuclear decay occurs when we have matter that is converted 
to energy. We're not talking about burning a piece of wood and generating energy from that wood, liberating energy from that wood. We're talking about actually changing the matter into energy. When you burn wood, you get a lot of energy produced, right? It heats up and you see this light, this light given off in the form of fire and whatever. And then, then the wood disappears, right? But it doesn't really disappear. You have carbon dioxide produced. You have all kinds of other stuff produced, whatever, right? The mass still stays the same. It's just redistributed. But when we're talking about nuclear reaction or nuclear decay. We're talking about matter actually changing into energy, not just becoming some other kind of matter that we can't see, but it's actually changing into energy. And that can happen in a number of ways. We'll talk about that in a lot more detail near the end of the semester. That's how gamma rays are produced. Um, yep. Question, yeah. All right. I want to talk briefly about how this theory of electromagnetic radiation or this explanation of EMR was verified or at least supported. You guys have seen this name before, Hertz, Heinrich Hertz, a German guy who did a lot of work with electromagnetic radiation, including being the first guy to essentially uh, provide evidence to support Maxwell's theory of EMR. Here's what Hertz did. He took an apparatus that had these wires going through it, but a gap in the wire, a break in the wire. And he induced a really large potential difference across that gap. And the reason he did that is because he wanted electrons to accelerate across the gap. The experiment looks something like this. This whole thing over here, don't lose any sleep over. Hey, that's not what's important to you. I'm just drawing it because that's the way his, his experiment essentially looked. What's important to you is this, this little gap right here. There's a large potential difference induced across this gap, and that's going to cause electrons to jump across the gap. It's kind of like taking a board like this and putting a deck of cards on the board or putting your phone on the board or putting a book on the board and slowly increasing the slope of the board. At some point, what's going to happen? Yeah, it's going to slide, right? That deck of cards or that phone or that book is going to start sliding down. It's going to start accelerating, right? If you induce a big enough hill, then that phone is going to accelerate down the hill. If you induce a big enough potential difference across this gap, then the electrons will accelerate across the gap. Now, in addition to this spark gap where Hertz causes electrons to accelerate across, he's got an antenna. The antenna is made out of metal. It's a conductor. That's it. It's a conducting wire. If this antenna detects something, and we know it detects something when a current is produced in it, and yeah, that's all an antenna is, Okay, you got the antenna of the radio of your car. You look outside, what's it made out of? Metal, because you need to induce a current in that antenna. The antenna in your phone, you don't see it because it's inside the phone, but it's metal. It's a wire, basically, um, because you need to have a current induced in it. But what induces the current? Well, a changing electric and magnetic field. So the idea here is this. If Hertz observes a current in the antenna, if he measures the current in the antenna, then that must mean that there was a changing electric and a changing magnetic field. And those two fields must have been caused by the accelerating charge. And that's Maxwell's theory, right? That's it. If he detects an electric current right here, then Maxwell's theory must be right. We must have a changing electric field and a changing magnetic field, and it must have been caused by the accelerating charge across that gap. Hertz did this experiment with really low frequency EMR, specifically radio waves, and he detected an electric current in the antenna. And that told him, Maxwell's right. Electric fields, magnetic fields, caused by accelerating charged particles.